And our co-host, the New York Times best-selling author, John Gilstrap. Good morning, Johnny. Good morning. How are you? I'm well. And in studio in our first uh, segment, you should feel at home because there's a uh, New Yorker in studio this morning. Uh, yes, I know. I know. A real New Yorker. And you being a New York Times bestselling author, exactly. there's some connection there. There's absolute connection right there. Hey, listen, I want to fold into something that was in, in the news today, and that goes to uh, the smoke detector. Uh, make sure you have working smoke detectors. As a former firefighter? As a former firefighter, I will tell you that it was... I, I don't remember a single time. I mean, certainly I've, I've had the misfortune of... of pulling people out of incidents that were no longer mm-hmm. with us. It was rare. Only one case can I think of where it was actually as a result of burns, that burns were, were involved. It's the smoke that kills people in, in fires and yeah. the, the toxic materials that are in everything from wallpaper to the cushions in your, in your sofa. That's all very toxic stuff. And it, it, spreads through a house long before the flames do. So that's the importance of the smoke detector. And the flip side of that is to make sure that you have to have a plan for what you do when the smoke detector goes off. If you hear it and you open the door and then the hallway is full of smoke, the option of going down the hall to get your kids is kind of out, you know, Mm -hmm. it's so make sure if you've got kids that they know what to do. Obviously, the rules are different for infants and toddlers than they are for older kids. But if you expect them to climb out a window, make sure that they can open the window and really kind of do an affirmative planning on this stuff because it's the panic. Um, it's I don't know if you've ever been in one of these situations, but it, the panic ramps up very, very quickly. And the only solution to the panic is to actually have a plan and to execute the plan. So I don't want to start on a negative note, but I think it's really important, folks, that that not only do you have the, the working smoke detectors. Yes, they're annoying when they chirp. Replace the batteries and, and that will stop. But then on the flip side, make sure you have a plan for how you're going to get out when uh, when they go off and then where to meet. So that once you go outside to take inventory on on the family, mm-hmm. meet at the mailbox or wherever you're, you're you're going to be meeting, so that you can count heads. And then if you if you come up short, well, that's that's you know somebody's yeah, it's a much greater situation. emergency. And yep. if nothing else, you can tell the first arriving engine company that you know we Matthew's missing or, mm-hmm. or or whatever. But like I said, it's kind of a negative way to start. But it was in the news, and I just can't tell you folks, it seconds really do matter. And sleep with your doors closed. That adds minutes to the survivability in a fire. Interesting. I didn't know that. Because the door, if you think about it, smoke, heat rises and the smoke travels across. Once the smoke gets to a closed door, it's kind of locked out of the bedroom mm-hmm. for a while. And it, it buys whole minutes on, on the escape plan. Well, there you go. The safety minute with the former safety there engineer. You go. <laughs> yeah. so. Well done, sir. Our guest in this segment uh, moved here recently and has already uh, wasted very little time getting involved in uh, her community and you may have read this article in the journal uh, i think about a week ago or so i was reading this story of this uh, young three-year-old who was in need of a heart transplant and uh, gabriella's warriors are behind trying to help the family and uh, the three-year-old get through this situation. So Evelyn Kropp contacted me and asked to come on the program to talk more about this. And I'm glad to have you here, Evelyn. Good morning. Welcome in. Great to see you. Good morning, Rob. Thank you for having me. So uh, before we get into Gabriella's Warriors, uh, you moved here within the last two years from upstate New York. I did. You live in Hedgesville. I do. Okay. Uh, Tell me how you got from there to here. From upstate New York, it was my... And and don't say (laughs) (laughs) U-Haul. Well, my husband came up with this idea. Uh, We both felt the taxes and the politics in New York were really um, oppressive, I think is the best word I could use. So we moved here two years ago, and it's been a wonderful move for us. We love Hedgesville, we love West Virginia, and we're we're happy to be here and really want to be a part of things. Well, welcome. And uh, uh, by the way, a, a note in terms of our program today, our internet for our Facebook feed is down this morning. So last I heard from Colin, we were not able to stream the show to Facebook. However, we're still out on the radio, AM 740 and FM 106.5. And if you have Comcast Cable on Comcast Cable TV Channel 10 to all of our viewers in Berkeley at in Jefferson County. But otherwise, if you're listening on the radio or watching on TV and thought you might catch the Facebook feed uh, later on this morning, based on where you were headed to, uh, right now it's not available. Uh, now, back to the matter at hand here. So, Evelyn, you, you, you wind up in Hedgesville, and you, 
now involved in helping out with Gabriella and Gabriella's family as they deal with this situation, which we're going to get into in just a second. How did you get involved in helping out with this situation as a new person to the area? I joined the Independent Bible Church here in Martinsburg, and uh, the Eustaces, who you're going to hear more about, uh, Father Miguel, uh, the Father Miguel, is uh, a youth pastor there. Okay, very good. Now, tell me about Gabriella. So Gabriella is three, and shortly before uh, she was born, her parents learned that she had something called hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And what that means is that her heart did not develop uh, appropriately. And so our, the left side of our heart is the most important part because it pumps all that oxygenated blood to the rest of our body. Mm-hmm. So she struggles with um, you know, difficulty breathing sometimes if she overdoes it. Um, she spends time in and out of the hospital for various reasons. So for an active three-year-old, it's, it's a tough life. And she needs a transplant at this point. Normally there are procedures that kind of ramp up before you get to that point, but she's been moved a little further along in the priority list unexpectedly. That is true. So normally a child with, we call it HLHS for short, there's three different procedures that they do um, as they grow. The point being you want to wait for a transplant as long as possible because it is such a taxing thing on the body. Um, but so Gabriella had two of those three procedures in the first couple of years of her life. But then when they started doing testing um, earlier this year to determine if it was time to do the third, what they discovered was um, her body and her heart are suffering so much that she's not a candidate for the third anymore. And the doctors are now recommending a heart transplant. Uh, tell me about uh, Gabriella. Uh, I know in the letter you sent to me, you said some days you can't tell there's anything that's an issue with Gabriella. Oh, my goodness. It's very true. When I run into her on Sunday mornings, she's wandering around in the hallways. She has a big brother, Josiah, who she is bound and determined to keep up with. Um, you Most of the time, you would never know that, that she is sick. And I'm sure, you know, when she is feeling ill, her parents keep her home, but... She's got pigtails and big eyes and rosy cheeks, and she's just a delight. And what does Gabriella's Warriors hope to accomplish? So what we're trying to do is really help the family um, with transplant expenses. Most people think, oh, well, it's a medical procedure, so therefore the insurance will cover it. And insurance does cover the medical part, but there's so much more that goes into it. Trips to Philadelphia, her transplant will be at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. There is no hospital in West Virginia that does pediatric heart transplants. Um, So, you know, trips to Philadelphia every month for one to two days for her to get testing. And when the transplant finally happens, they will be there for a number of weeks. And they can't leave the hospital area. They need to be close to it um, in case something happens even after she's released. So you're hoping to raise funds to help to defray some of the costs. Exactly. Yeah. So we um, we've developed a website. Um, it's www.tinyurl backslash Gabriella's Warriors. And what you'll find there is um, different products that my daughter designed, and she uh, prints them up and sells them. And you know, they're, she's donating all of her time. So 50, about 50% of each item goes directly to the family. Very good. And again, how do you get to the site? It's www.tinyurl backslash Gabriella, G-A-B-R-I-E-L-A, warriors.com. John Gilstrap. I, <clears throat> the challenges of, of having a child in, in medical straits like that has to be huge. I guess my question is, when uh, when an adult has a heart transplant, that's traumatic enough. When a child has a heart transplant, does does the transplant have to come from another child, or is the the larger bank of available hearts, such as it is, is given that there's a match, can she take a older person's heart? So hearts really go by size. So you know, an older child, a larger child may be able to have an adult heart. But unfortunately, someone Gabriella's age um, will need a child's heart. And, you know, the Eustaces are very aware of that and what a tremendous, difficult sacrifice that would be for a family. Um, That's not something they ever lose sight of. Well, and it's also a a blessing in in the sense that 
to to be to go through a tragedy like that in, in one's own life and then be able to bring life to someone else is is a blessing in its, in its own right a very a kind of, i guess a dark blessing but but something to keep in keep in mind that go ahead i was just going to say absolutely i can tell you that um you know i'm a designated organ donor i as a nurse i encourage everyone to be an organ donor because you are giving a gift that really is is life is life itself Tell us as a nurse about the transplant procedure, what's involved in the prepping of the patient and the transport of the organ, and then the after effects of making sure the body accepts. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite a process. So, um, you know, the organ itself can only be out of a body for so long. Most of us have seen on TV the red Playmate coolers that they carry them in. And uh, my understanding is that's, that's really the case. Um, so she will need to be close to the hospital when that happens. Um, and the process itself, I mean, she will be in the hospital for several weeks. Um, you know, and it's a major, major operation. You're talking about a small child being on the operating table for hours. Um, and then she'll stay in the hospital, be monitored carefully. And for the rest of her life, she will be on anti-rejection medicines, which have a lot of side effects, um, and they're uh, very expensive. So this is a, a lifelong expense that the parents and, and Gabrielle herself ultimately will be facing. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, they, they have good insurance for her, which they're, you know, extremely grateful for. Um, but yes, they'll, they'll be facing this, she will be facing this really for the rest of her life. The good thing is, you know, hearts grow with the, with the patient. So um, it isn't like she'll need to redo this all that often, but as she becomes an adult, she may need, again, to face a transplant in the future. Oh my. I did not know that you had a lifelong attachment with the anti-rejection drugs when you had a transplant. Is that true for every organ? I honestly don't know the answer to that, but I think, I believe so. Um, you never, you never want to go into rejection, especially with something like a heart, because if, you know, if you reject your heart, that's, uh, there's not a good long-term replacement for that function. So you're really facing a life-threatening yeah. situation. The fundraiser that your daughter is doing, is that the only fundraiser for Gab that Gabriella's family has on their behalf? Are there others? Are there, are there direct donation links you can go to as well? There are. You can um, donate uh, th right through our website. There's an option to, to send only a donation if you're not interested in any of the products. Um, I know other um, friends and family have tried to raise some funds through a GoFundMe. There is a GoFundMe for Gabriella. She has a Caring Bridge site, if people are familiar with that. She has a Facebook site where people can follow her journey. Um, so yeah, there have been some, some other, other attempts but you know, it's every little bit helps. Mm -hmm. And I was just in a position, especially because of my daughter and her business, which is sublimation printing and design, um, to be able to help. Where, is your daughter local or is she in New York? She is actually in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Fayetteville, North Carolina, okay, very good. Tell me about the Eustace family. Do they have other children as well? Is Gabriella the only child? No, so Gabriella has a big brother, Josiah. Oh, I'm sorry, you mentioned Josiah earlier. Yes. and. Uh, at any given second, which is why the Eustaces did not join us today, they are expecting baby Noah. So we thought baby Noah would be here by now, but he is being quite stubborn and seems quite content where he is, much to his parents' dismay. My first son was like that nine days late. We didn't think he was ever gonna join us. Well, you know, it's a crazy world out there, so <laughs> I, I, stay where you are. <laughs> I can see why baby Noah feels the way he does. Hunker down, burrow in, right? <laughs> uh, was, was this uh, something that was uh, passed along in the DNA? Did it, did it happen while uh, Gabrielle was in the womb? Did it happen after she was born? Any idea how the, this condition took place? Set and set itself? There is a genetic component to it. Um, they were greatly relieved to learn that this does not affect baby Noah. Um, but, you know, where it starts, no one really knows. But it is common in families that have one child that other children may suffer from it as well. So is Gabriella at that stage where the parents have the pager and they're waiting to get the notification that this is ready to go at, at any moment? Is that is that where we are or are we still in the... 
waiting process to get there. I'm sorry, John, but I think you're showing your age. I don't know anyone who has a pager anymore. <laughs> okay, <laughs> fine. <laughs> you know, I knew I liked you, Evelyn, and now I really like you a lot. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean... I guess they get, like, a phone call or something. Yeah, they, they? <laughs> yeah they, keep, they keep the cell phone handy now. Okay. Um, yeah, so she just got activated at the beginning of this month on the transplant list. Typically, a transplant is definitely waiting weeks, um, you know, anywhere up to two years. It or tomorrow. Away. Or tomorrow, yes, which would be a little difficult right now with baby Noah on the way. But, you know, when it happens, it happens, and they'll make it happen. Now, for the the housing challenges and such, the Ronald McDonald House, and there are another, and the only one pops into my mind, but there, I know there are others. Are they involved with this as well in, in her case? Is, is that a... Yes, there are some um, places near CHOP like that, um, and people think they're free, and they aren't. They are hugely discounted. I mean, mm -hmm. don't get me wrong. They're wonderful, um, and they're hugely discounted over staying in a hotel, but there usually is a cost associated with that. So is there a goal? Is there a financial goal that you're trying to hit, or as much as we can get? As much as we can get. I mean... You know, my goal would be a million. That may be a little overshot. Um, but whatever the Lord blesses us with, we are truly grateful just to be able to help the Eustace family. Gabriella Eustace is a three-year-old with a heart condition. It has deteriorated. She's going to need a transplant. You may have seen this article in the journal. I think it was last week. Uh, Evelyn Kropp is with us from Gabriella's Warriors in uh, an attempt to try to raise some money for the family to take care of some of the expenses not covered by medical insurance. And Evelyn, again, where can people... Uh, find out ways to donate money. And uh, even uh, as you said, your daughter has some products that she's made that 50% uh, will go to the Eustace family. Where can they do that? So it's www.tinyurl backslash Gabriella's Warriors. And that's G-A-B-R-I-E-L-A W-A-R-R-I-O-R-S. And on that page, they can click a direct donate button as well. There's all kind of options there. Absolutely. And there really are some beautiful products, you know, tote bags and that kind of thing, uh, with one of our favorite Bible verses, which is Psalm 11950. And uh, it, she was moved up on the priority list, but she's not the highest priority yet, correct? Correct. So there's three levels um, for people who are needing a heart transplant. There's uh, two which is, you know, I'm sick, but I'm functional and I'm doing well on my meds, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll need a transplant soon. And then there's 1B, which is kind of the middle of the road. I'm pretty sick. It's time for a transplant. And then there's 1A, which most people who are 1A are either in the hospital or they have something called a ventricular assist device or a VAD, which is a uh, uh, something that is implanted and it helps to push that oxygenated blood out to the rest of the body. And is there a any estimate of time frame as to when she absolutely needs to get this heart transplant or does that really just depend on what happens next health wise? It really is all about her health. You know, her parents um, monitor her medicine very closely, always make sure she's getting it. Um, but she's Right now, she's she's what we consider to be pretty stable, but you know the doctors have said her heart her heart is pretty sick. You may realize when you go to the doctor, they put that little thing on your finger to measure the oxygen level in your blood. Mm -hmm. So for a healthy adult or child, it should be above ninety five. Gabriella generally runs in the low eighties mm. um, because that's her heart just not able to get all that oxygenated blood out to her body. But again, a lot of the time you wouldn't know that. Any idea how this was diagnosed, how they discovered it? Uh, with a pre, um, prenatal ultrasound, which uh, is extremely important that people follow through and get those. Um, you, it's, even though it's a difficult thing that the Eustaces are facing, it's good to know beforehand. Helps you mentally get prepared, learn about it, that kind of thing. Also, not to be a radio proofreader, when you gave out the the URL, you said Gabriella's uh, Warriors, but you didn't put in the S. So is it is it Gabriella Warrior? It's or? Gabriella's Warriors with an S. With an S, okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. All right. This is why we keep them around, Evelyn. Oh, good. I, I kind of wonder. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been lovely having you on the show. <laughs> <laughs> that and the occasional pager reference. Uh, <laughs> You don't, you don't get a lot about uh, John does a lot of editing because he writes a lot of books. 
Oh, good. And that's that's, well, that's the reason why. He is a New York Times bestselling author. Ah, wow. That's impressive. What do you write about, John? Thrillers. Oh. I, I save the world. Uh, well, Every I, year. Uh, I'm an avid reader, so I'll be looking those all up. Right. Yeah, there's 27 books that he's written, you know. Oh, my. I'm pretty old. I'm not sure I can get through them all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Evelyn, how do you... I know you say you, he's your minister. Uh, uh, Mr. Eustace is the minister of the church that you go to. But I'm sure you've got several members, and I'm sure some of them are more involved in this than others. Uh, why are you so involved in it? Really, because I'm just in the position with my daughter's business, which is called SubVat, Um that she's able to do 90% of the work and I do the promotion. I am, mm -hmm. I'm just so grateful for her help. You know, I could have just donated. That was my first thought. Well, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to donate some money, but I want, I just wanted to do more because I know how difficult this can be for a family. And this is because of your nursing background. I think it is because of my nursing background. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But did you study nursing in school or did you come to it later? Oh no. I, um, I actually got my LPN when I was in high school so uh, that's, they did that's that. That's impressive. They did that back in the 80s. Um, <laughs> and, and then I got my RN in 1993. So I've been a nurse for a really, really long time. So uh, you just moved to West Virginia and specifically Hedgesville two years ago. So what do you think of the area so far coming from upstate New York? My goodness. I love West Virginia and I love this area. I People here are friendly. They are kind. Um I know that sometimes people out in Hedgesville get a little frustrated with the transplants who don't seem to want to fit in, um, but we really just want to fit in uh, with that friendly, kind nature. Well, I'll tell you a little story. Um, 30 something years ago, I had a rental car and uh, it ran out of gas somewhere around exit five on ID one. And I walked down the ramp to get to the closest gas station. This would have been probably 1989, 1990, somewhere around there. And I walk in and uh, I say to the lady behind the counter, I ran out of gas up on the interstate. Uh, I don't have a gas can. Do you have a gas can I can use? Sure, honey, right there. Okay. Now, at the time, I, had, I, had, I grew up in Pittsburgh. I lived in Fairfax County, where John came from, and also Montgomery County, two very large suburban areas in the Washington, D.C. region. And if you needed a gas can, you had to leave your firstborn behind <laughs> to get the gas can and leave the premises with it. So I said to the lady, uh, do you need my driver's license, $20 deposit? What do you need for the gas can? So he goes, well, honey, just go get the gas, fill it up, and take it to your car, and then bring it back with your car. <laughs> and I thought to myself... That's as friendly as any exchange I've had in the last four years since I moved from Pittsburgh has been. I said, I got to find out more about these people. So I ended up working here and I've been here for 33 years uh, working in the air. It's a wonderful community. I'm, I'm glad you've been welcomed into it. And I'm glad you're being an active part of it as well, getting involved with Gabriella's Warriors. Yes, I'm, I'm excited to be here. Um, we look forward to spending the rest of our lives here in this area. Um, and I'm just really grateful for those who've already stepped up um, and bought some products and donated and have been so supportive. And again, to make a donation to Gabriella's Warriors, go to what site? www.tinyurl backslash Gabriella's Warriors. Evelyn Crop, great to meet you. Great to meet you, too. Please let us know how this continues and how it goes. I certainly will. Thank you so much.